Hello, my name is Barb Farrell. I'm a pharmacist in the Breyer Continuing Care Geriatric Day Hospital and one of the leads of the Deprescribing Guidelines Program of Research at the Breyer Research Institute in Ottawa. Our research team has developed several evidence-based guidelines for deprescribing. Deprescribing refers to the planned and supervised process of dose reduction or stopping of medication that may be causing harm or no longer be providing benefit. Each guideline includes a two-page algorithm to help make decisions about when to reduce or stop a medication and how to do so safely, while managing other symptoms that may arise. This video shows how to use the antihyperglycemic deprescribing algorithm. Antihyperglycemics lower blood sugar levels and are used to treat people with type 2 diabetes. Our first case is Dorothy a 70-year-old woman who is relatively healthy and living at home with her husband. Starting at the top of the algorithm, we ask ourselves if she is at risk for hypoglycemia, having any side effects from her antihyperglycemics, or if there's an uncertain clinical benefit. From her records, we learn that Dorothy's blood sugar ranges from 6 to 10 millimoles per liter, her recent A1C was 6.9%, and she's taking metformin 1 gram twice daily and gliburide 10 milligrams twice daily, in addition to other medications. At her age and state of health, she stands to benefit from diabetes treatment in order to reduce the risk of microvascular and cardiovascular disease. She says she's had an occasional low blood sugar in the 3 to 4 millimoles per liter range, but says it's nothing to worry about. On questioning, she doesn't appear to have specific side effects with her diabetes medications, though she finds she does need to take the metformin with food to prevent stomach upset. Her creatinine clearance is 70 mils per minute, indicating good kidney function. Dorothy meets the criteria to use the algorithm. She's over 65, she's had occasional hypoglycemia, and she's at future risk because she's taking gliburide. The first step is to set individualized targets. At a healthy 70 years old, an A1C less than 7% is appropriate with the same blood sugar targets as one would expect in younger patients. We also address whether Dorothy has anything else contributing to hypoglycemia, reviewing her dietary habits, especially skipping meals and other medications. We check to see if she stopped taking any medications that could have caused high blood sugar in the past thus making her more susceptible to low blood sugar from her antihyperglycemic medications. Then we check to see if any other medications might be interacting with her antihyperglycemics or causing hypoglycemia themselves. Dorothy is not taking and doesn't have a recent history of taking any of the medications that can affect glycemic control. However, she is taking a sulfonylurea, so she continues to be at risk of hypoglycemia. In terms of deprescribing, there are several options. The dose of gliburide could be reduced, but this may affect her overall glucose control, which has been right at target recently. Another approach would be to switch gliburide to an agent with a lower risk of hypoglycemia, like glyclozide or non-sulfonylurea. For Dorothy, we don't need to consider reducing doses based on renal function because her creatinine clearance was good. The notes on the back side of the algorithm stress the importance of a conversation about deprescribing to explain the rationale, in this case the risks of hypoglycemia, and the process for deprescribing. These recommendations are informed by interviews with patients about facilitators for deprescribing. After reviewing the options with Dorothy, she chooses to switch to glycoside MR, 120 mg once daily, happy with the reduced number of pills. We'll ask Dorothy to monitor blood sugar daily, checking some pre-meal and post-meal sugars for one to two weeks to ensure the dose is correct. We can also ask her to report any signs of hyperglycemia, such as excessive thirst, urination or fatigue, as well as signs of hypoglycemia. If hypoglycemia continues, options include lowering the dose or switching to an agent that doesn't cause hypoglycemia. On the back side of the algorithm, we've listed agents associated with higher risk of hypoglycemia. At a follow-up appointment several months later, Dorothy indicates she's had no more hypoglycemia, her blood sugar tests have been consistently less than 10 millimoles per liter, 
and her A1C continues to be less than 7%. Our next case is Joe, a 93-year-old gentleman who lives in an assisted living retirement home complex. As we did with Dorothy, we ask ourselves if he is at risk for hypoglycemia, having any side effects from his antihyperglycemics, or if there is uncertain clinical benefit. From his records, we learn that Joe's blood sugar ranges from 2.8 to 9.4 millimoles per liter. His recent A1C was 6.3%, and he's taking metformin 1 gram twice daily, gliburide 10 milligrams twice daily, citagliptin 100 milligrams daily, and NPH insulin 10 units at bedtime, in addition to other medications. He recently had his hydrochlorothiazide and metoprolol stopped due to dizziness but is still feeling dizzy, weak, confused, and has had a few falls. He's feeling embarrassed about frequent diarrhea and is also bothered by frequent lung infections, which are usually treated with septra. Finally, his creatinine clearance is 40 mils per minute, indicating a reduction in kidney function. When medications for diabetes were started many years ago, Joe stood to benefit in terms of reduction of future microvascular and cardiovascular illness. However, occasional low blood sugar and considering other symptoms that may be related to his diabetes medications, it's a good time to reevaluate for potential deprescribing. Joe meets the criteria to use the algorithm. He's over 65, has relatively tight glycemic control, has multiple comorbidities, and a greater potential for drug interactions. He's also had occasional hypoglycemia, possibly with dizziness and falls, has impaired kidney function, and he's at future risk of hypoglycemic episodes because he's taking gliburide and NPH insulin. He also may be having diarrhea associated with his metformin, and there's some uncertainty about the clinical benefit of treatment given his age and comorbidities. The first step is to determine individualized targets for Joe. Given his advancing age, frailty, and comorbidities, an A1C target of less than 8.5% and aiming for blood glucose generally less than 12 millimoles per liter is likely appropriate. This gives us some room to think about reducing some of the antihyperglycemic burden. We also need to look at potential contributors to hypoglycemia, and in Joe's case, the periodic use of SEPTRA is problematic because it can increase levels of gliburide, thereby increasing the risk of hypoglycemia. He's also had two drugs that can cause hyperglycemia stopped recently. This could make him even more susceptible to hypoglycemia at this time. For the deprescribing plan, we need to consider reducing or stopping medications contributing to hypoglycemia. In this case, we could stop his gliburide. This would eliminate the drug interaction risk with his periodic septra. We could also look at reducing or stopping his NPH insulin to further reduce hypoglycemia risk. Switching to other agents like gliburide to glycoside or NPH to lantus could also be options if glucose rises above the target. We also need to consider reducing doses or stopping renally eliminated drugs, especially if they may be contributing to side effects. In this case, since the metformin may be contributing to diarrhea, we could look at lowering the dose. Now it's time to review the various options with Joe and his family. Joe's pleased about the idea of taking less medication, but a bit nervous because he's had diabetes for so many years. It's important to clearly explain the risks of low blood sugar and other possible side effects as the reasons for deprescribing. In particular, his family would benefit from understanding that Joe's reduced cognition may make it hard for him to respond to hypoglycemia symptoms and that the potential harm of hypoglycemia can outweigh any continued benefit of tight control of his diabetes at this time. In terms of how changes can be made, there's no evidence for one best tapering approach. Simply stopping the gliburide is fine, but some patients may feel more comfortable reducing doses gradually. Joe's family decides to stop the gliburide immediately and then reduce the metformin next week to 500 milligrams twice daily. Retirement home staff agree to help Joe check his blood sugar a little more often over the next few weeks as changes are made. A logbook with the new targets, as well as signs and symptoms of high blood sugar, is provided. Over the next two weeks, the gliburide is stopped and the metformin reduced. 
The staff report no issues with increased blood sugar beyond the target and no new issues with thirst, urination, or fatigue. Best of all, from Joe's point of view, the diarrhea improved significantly and he was able to stop using loperamide. At a follow-up appointment several months later, Joe's A1C is 7.9%. Most of his blood sugars have been less than 12 millimoles per liter, none above 13, and no further episodes of hypoglycemia. At this time, the family asks if Joe still needs the NPH insulin since he doesn't like having the injection. The NPH is stopped and further monitoring shows blood sugar remaining at target. I hope you found these examples helpful to understand how to use the antihyperglycemic deprescribing algorithm to make decisions about when and how to reduce their use. Remember, the goal of deprescribing is to reduce medication burden and harm while maintaining or improving quality of life. It should always be done with planning and supervision by a healthcare professional to make sure it's appropriate and safe. The Deprescribing Guidelines project was initially funded by the Government of Ontario through the Ontario Pharmacy Research Collaboration. The Antihyperglycemics Deprescribing Guideline development was funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I'd like to thank our guideline development team members and staff as well as those who contributed to developing and reviewing each of the deprescribing guidelines and algorithms included in this important initiative.